looking at here is a firefly, a juvenile firefly called a larva, which in this long exposure photograph has, is walking down this twig and leaving behind it a trail of light that's been produced by these two tiny tail organs, light organs on its tail. And inside these light organs uh, is an enzyme called luciferase, which uh, is Latin for light bearer, which binds its substrate, luciferin, and uses oxygen and ATP to get the luciferin molecule so uh, chemically excited that it actually gives off light. This was a remarkable invention. So you might be wondering, wait, what is the point of these juveniles being so conspicuous? They're way too young to be looking for love, right? So we know these juveniles contain toxins that help them avoid getting eaten. So the evidence suggests that firefly light first evolved as a warning. It's like a neon sign that shines out into the darkness and says, I'm toxic, stay away to any would-be predators. From these juvenile lights, adult fireflies have branched out to use remarkably diverse courtship signals. That is many different ways to find and attract mates. So the very first adult firefly probably looked something like this. These so-called daytime dark fireflies, as the name implies, fly during the daytime and they don't light up. Instead, the males use fantastic antennae that you can see here to sniff out pheromones or scents that are given off by their females. This handsome male happens to be from Ecuador, but here in North America, we also have daytime dark fireflies that are in fact quite common. And here's one of them that you might be seeing right now. <clears throat> it's called the winter firefly or Alicnia carusca. And these guys are really unusual um, because they overwinter uh, as adults uh, on tree trunks. So they wedge themselves into the crevices in tree trunks and they overwinter, they spend the entire winter there. And then now, starting around now, early spring, April, they will begin to um, walk around and find mates. You'll see them, if you spend a lot of time like I do, looking at tree trunks, you'll see these winter fireflies, very common in the um, mating position, typical for fireflies on um, tree trunks starting now. And they're easy to identify because they have a, um, the head shield or, or pronotum has a dark spot in the center that is uh, bordered by two parentheses, um, these yellow parentheses shaped um, strips with that are bordered by red, very, very distinctive um, head shield. Here's another winter firefly, and uh, sorry, another daytime dark firefly. It's called the black firefly. And these guys come out a little bit later in the um, early summer. You'll see them flying around during the daytime, Lucidota atra. They're distinguished by having these flattened sawtoothed or serrated antennae. Again, a very, very distinctive look to their head shield. Very, very bright yellow and, um, and bright red. And you'll see these guys flying during the daytime, zigzagging around, males flying, looking for females. And they're, they're attracted to the scents that females um, release. So it took many million years before some adult fireflies like this proud male co-opted the larval lights that juveniles invented and turned them into the quick bright flashes that the lightning bug fireflies now use to find and attract their mates. So here is a um, male big dipper firefly, Phytinus pyralis. They're called big dippers because their body size is, they're kind of big. 
And the males, as they fly along, make uh, they dip down and then rise up, making J-shaped flashes as they um, as they fly. This is a firefly that's a uh, lightning bug firefly that's very common across most of the eastern United States. Um, it is uh, a habitat generalist. It's found in on lawns, in parking lots, in um, fields, in urban parks. It's actually the main firefly that you'll see in uh, Washington, D.C., in Baltimore. It's in Central Park and Prospect Park in New York City. It's in Atlanta. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite make it up to Boston, which is where I live. I'm very disappointed about that. But uh, Big Dipper fireflies, they're great. They're actually, um, in North America, we have three common groups or genera of lightning bug fireflies. And they're distinguished really by tiny differences in their genitalia, but also by some really easy to see field characters, um, including, so this is um, Photinus, meet Photinus, Pyractamina, and Photurus. And you can tell a Pyractamina lightning bug when you have it in your hand or you're looking at it on a leaf because the head shield has a midline ridge. So if you gently brushed your finger across this, you would see that the midline is raised up. That's a Pyractamina. In contrast to Photinus, which has either a flat pronotum or sometimes a little groove like this, or Photurus, which has a flat pronotum. And you can tell Futurus fireflies from these other two genera because they have, relative to their body size, very long legs. We'll be talking about those in a moment. And they also have a kind of hunchbacked posture. So I know at first glance, these might look kind of similar. They all have similar coloration. But it's kind of like spring warblers, right? Once you key into the differences, it's really easy to tell them apart. So I would encourage you to take a look, a uh, closer look at these fireflies when you see them. Okay, so the last group of fireflies is the glowworm fireflies, like this European glowworm. And in this group, the females light up, but they're wingless. So every night they climb up onto perches where they'll glow for hours to attract flying males. Here in the United States, we have a lot of glowworm fireflies. Um, the best known one is probably the blue ghost firefly in the Southern Appalachians. And so again, and this is a species where the females shown here are flightless, they don't have any wings. They do have these really cute glow spots, right? Really cute. The males, in this case, um, uh, also light up. And they fly around with these long-lasting glows as they search for these glowing females who are nestled down in the leaf litter. So glowing uh, glowworm fireflies actually make up about a quarter of all uh, firefly species worldwide. So it's a very common lifestyle, which is great because it lets females devote more energy to reproduction. They don't have to fly around, no energy for flight. But it's also very risky because they spend their whole life down on the ground. It's very easy for them to accidentally get trampled. And if their habitat gets wiped out, they're gone. They can't just pick up and move. So it's a, a bit of a risky lifestyle. OK, last myth. Fireflies mean summertime, right? Seems like it, but no, these spectacular displays are made only by the adult fireflies, and they are just a tiny bit of the whole firefly life cycle, which is mostly spent in juvenile stages. So let's take a look at some of these juvenile stages. So like all beetles, Fireflies undergo what's called complete metamorphosis. They start out their life as eggs, which by the way, sometimes glow. And then those eggs hatch out into a larval stage. And as we've seen, all firefly larvae grow, glow. They also grow. 
these are many, many different species of um, larvae. Um, some uh, live underground, some live underwater, some live on people's hands, some climb trees. All of firefly larvae are predatory. So um, they use these incredible jaws. They have sickle-shaped jaws that they use to bite their prey, which includes snails, slugs, earthworms, any kind of soft-bodied insect. And they uh, will bite their prey and paralyze it, which allows them to eat things that are much, much bigger than themselves. So um, the purpose, well, the, the, these predatory larvae spend their time eating and growing, eating and growing. They grow through several instars shedding their exoskeleton before they eventually form a pupa which will eventually transform into an adult. So that's complete metamorphosis. And in North American fireflies, um, like Photinus, their life cycle might look something like this. So um, after the adults do their thing, the female will lay her eggs, generally in soil or at the base of vegetation, and it takes about two weeks for these eggs to hatch out into larvae, which crawl down into the ground. So all North American fireflies, the larval stage lives underground. And Photinus fireflies are actually earthworm specialists. That's what they eat. And they, um, they gang up on the earthworms. And again, they use uh, um, paralyzing neurotoxins to inject their prey and then paralyze it and then slowly um, consume the prey over many, many days. When these guys, these guys will spend um, several months underground and when they get big enough, they will eventually transform into a pupa also underground and then that about after about two weeks that the pupae will emerge into an adult firefly. Adult fireflies, once they become adult, most fireflies don't eat anything at all. So the juvenile stage, during the juvenile stage, this lasts about two years, whereas the adults live only about two weeks and they are concentrating completely on reproduction during that time. So there are two important things to notice here. One is that the adults and the larvae can occupy completely different habitats and that most of their life cycle is spent underground. So if we want to uh, promote fireflies survival, we need to protect the habitat that's used both for the adult display and also um, for the juveniles uh, to live and to find their prey. Okay, so on to romance. I know you're all waiting for this. So I call this part of the firefly life cycle splendors in the grass for obvious reasons. And um, it goes something like this. So for most fireflies, the males fly around and they advertise their presence by flashing in a particular pattern. Meanwhile, the females are lounging down below, surveying the skies. When a female sees a flash from a particularly attractive male, she'll curl her aunt lantern, her body, aiming her lantern in his direction and giving him a flash back. It's her come hither sign. He'll fly closer and he'll flash again. And if she still likes him, they'll start up a conversation in flashes. It's just like firefly sexting. If you were to diagram this, it might look something like this. So this is called a courtship flash dialogue. And in this um, instance, the male is producing a flash signal that's, um, that's a long single flash. It could be a double flash or a triple flash in other species. And this is, as he flies around, he repeats this flash at regular five second intervals. The female down below 
is looking at for the male, looking at the flash. And if she wants to, she will respond with usually a single flash that's given after a species specific time delay following the end of the male flash. So these flash codes, especially in Photinus, are species specific. So we've already seen, here's the Big Dipper firefly, Photinus pyralis, make flying along and the males dip down and make these and turn on their light and then uh, rise up quickly, making these J-shaped flash gestures um, that they get their name. Here's another species, Photinus marginalis, with a much uh, shorter single flash that's repeated at shorter intervals. Here's another species, Photinus consimilis, where the males give a triple flash pattern that again is repeated at intervals as the male flies along. Here's a species, Photinus granulatus, where the male gives a flicker flash as he flies along, and so on. In addition to the different flash patterns, different firefly species fly in different habitats. So some fly high up in the treetops, others will fly in grassy areas, lawns or fields. Some of them are found just at the margins of a field in a woodlands. A few like uh, Pyractamina are found in wetlands. Uh, and they also partition themselves in time. So there are some species, crepuscular species, um, or twilight active ones that come out just at sunset. These guys come out early enough so that you can still see their bodies. So the Big Dipper firefly, for example, is beloved by children uh, all over the United States because they come out at dusk and they're really easy to catch in a jar and, um, and then release them because they, you can see their bodies. It's easy to catch them in your hands or in a net. The, these guys, the crepuscular fireflies, will only fly for maybe 20 minutes or so, sometimes as few as 15 minutes. And then they'll stop for the night and night active fireflies will begin to come out um, after the crepuscular species have already gone to bed. So I hope that I've given you a new appreciation for scenes like this one. So the next time that you're standing out in a field, something like this, surrounded by fireflies, I'd like you to remember that what you're actually looking at here are the silent love songs of mostly male fireflies. I still think it's very romantic. Okay, I'm sorry to report that fireflies are not all sweetness and light. This dark side story is a tale of two fireflies. You've already met one of them, Photinus, tiny Photinus, uh, which is the lower one here. And the one that's hunkering above it belongs to a really unique group of North American fireflies that are found nowhere else and uh, are rather astonishing. These Futurus fireflies have big eyes, the better to see you with, my dear. They have really long legs. We saw these earlier, the better to grab you with, my dear. Now, I'm sure you'll remember that most adult fireflies don't eat anything once they turn into adults but these guys do. I know it's confusing, Faturus, Fatinus, Faturus, Fatinus. So I like to remember Fatini, Fatinus, and Faturus. I don't know. If the mnemonic doesn't help you, you can just forget about it. But in fact, if these fireflies were the size of house cats, I'm pretty sure that some people would be afraid to go out at night because these females have been dubbed femme fatale and have learned to target the males of other firefly species. So their hunt begins with a predatory uh, female 
sitting quietly on a leaf and eavesdropping on the courtship conversation that's going on between the male and the female of her intended prey. And so it might go something like this. First, the prey male flashes. Do you love me? His own female responds, maybe, not sure. He flashes again. Do you still love me? But this time, the predator sneaks in a reply that very cleverly mimics exactly what the other female just said. She is not looking for love. She's looking for dinner. And if she's good, she can lure this male close enough that she can reach out and grab him. And what happens next is captured in this very short 15 second video. I, if you're squeamish, you might wanna avert your eyes for just a few seconds. If you're eating dinner, I know some of you might be eating dinner, you might not wanna watch, but let me play it for you. So you can see that this uh, femme fatale has caught this male and she's really tearing into him. She's eating, biting his throat and um, chewing up all the soft parts, discarding the hard parts like the wing covers. This goes on for about an hour. And in the end, uh, all that is left are some scattered remains. So what in evolution's name drove this one particular group of fireflies to such a predatory extreme. Most adult fireflies don't eat anything. These guys eat a lot. Well, the answer to this question was provided by Tom Eisner, a chemical ecologist who spent an illustrious career at Cornell. And he discovered that these prey fireflies, just like their juveniles, can manufacture bitter tasting toxins um, called lucibufagens, we just call them LBGs, that are repellent to birds and other insectivores. But somewhere along the line, these pre predatory fireflies, this one particular group of Futurists, somehow lost the metabolic machinery that they need to make their own protective toxins. Instead, they have to resort to eating uh, and mi to mimicking and capturing other fireflies in order to get access to these protective chemicals. It's a remarkable story. Okay, the last story I want to tell you has the, the potential to be tragic, but I think actually that um, working together, we hope we will be able to avert this outcome. Now I've worked on fireflies, as Dan said, for many years. And the longer I've worked on fireflies, the more people I meet who say, huh, what's going on? I just don't see as many fireflies around as I used to when I was a kid. And together with these anecdotal reports, more and more firefly experts are also noticing that firefly populations are declining in many parts of the world. So this growing realization is what really sparked the formation of the Fireflyers International Network, which is a terrific group of international firefly researchers dedicated to firefly research, education, advocacy, and protection. We host a symposium every uh, few years. This is our meeting in 2014. We met in Gainesville, Florida. We also have a website. The address is here. And we have a conservation arm, which is this, uh, IUCN Firefly Specialist Group. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature uh, is the largest and most respected network of conservationists and biologists working to safeguard biodiversity around the world. 
You may have heard, they're the people who developed the red list. You may have heard of this. This is kind of the gold standard for identifying plants and animals that are threatened with a particularly high risk of extinction. So we started this firefly specialist group in um, 2018, and we've been busy since then. Last year, we uh, published a paper in bioscience in which we identified the top threats to firefly survival around the world. And so across all these ge biogeographic regions, it turned out that the top three threats to firefly survival turned out to be remarkably consistent. The pink, habitat loss, the yellow, light pollution, and the green, pesticide use. So let's take a look at these top three threats in a tiny bit more detail. Habitat loss is the main threat to biodiversity everywhere, particularly for uh, habitat specialists, things that can only live in one particular type of habitat, including fireflies that need uh, very specific conditions. So in Malaysia, the forests, which are home to the synchronous mangrove fireflies um, in the genus Pteroptix, these forests are being cut down to make way for oil palm plantations and shrimp farms. This isn't, habitat loss isn't just happening in Malaysia. Here in the United States, Delaware has an endemic species of firefly. It's called the Bethany Beach firefly, and it lives only in freshwater coastal wetlands. About 50 years ago, their habitat looked like this, but now it looks like this. This is a 2019 aerial photo that was taken from a real estate ad that was selling off these eight house lots that were um, built, well, the houses are now built, um, and they were built on top of one of the last remaining populations of this particular firefly species. So there's many different human activities that impact fireflies by destroying the habitat needed by um, firefly adults, larvae, and their prey. Here's another problem. Uh, it is one that in theory might be easier to solve. So this map is based on recent satellite data and it shows the full change in brightness of the night sky. These bright areas are anywhere between two and 20 times brighter than a natural no light pollution baseline dark sky. By some estimates, the Milky Way, our galaxy, is no longer visible to uh, more than a third of Earth's population, including 80% of the people who live in North America. And in this timeline, you can see how quickly this has increased in the last half century. Fortunately, light pollution is reversible if we can learn to switch off to shield and dim our light output we can avoid the situation that has been projected for 2025, which looks something like this. So who cares about light pollution? Well, personally, I like seeing the Milky Way, but really we should all care because we know that this extra light impacts humans and wildlife. And it has a particularly potent effect on fireflies because all this extra light is known to interfere with the signals that they use to find their mates. A lot of this research has been done on European glowworms. This is a female European glowworm here. And also our work at Tufts, which has shown experimentally that artificial light disrupts the courtship dialogue of US firefly species. I can um, put links to in the chat later to some of our papers um, for anyone who might be interested. Okay, the third and the last major threat is the overuse of pesticides. Even though the European Union banned neonicotinoids, so-called neonics, a couple years ago, they're still widely used in the rest of the world. These compounds are highly persistent in the soil, which as you remember is where firefly larvae hang out. 
They're, they're also known to be toxic to many beneficial insects, including bees, ladybird beetles, and um, earthworm, which are prey for many uh, firefly species. And in the United States, nearly all corn and soy is routinely coated with neonics before the seed is planted. In a recent field study, cornfields that were planted with treated seed had 70% fewer fireflies compared to control plots. This was a, a field trial that was done in Maryland. This is an animated loop that shows the steep rise in the agricultural use of one particular neonic, midocloprid, over 20 years from 1993 to 2014. And you can see the, the rapid increase um, across almost all of the US. These compounds are also widely marketed for residential use in gardens and lawns. And so, hey, look at this, a complete insect killer. Cool. Whoa, it kills soil insects for up to three months. Yeah, fireflies are insects. So worldwide, pesticide use constitutes a major threat to firefly populations. We're now at a very exciting point because we're ready to combine everything that we've learned in the past few decades about firefly behavior and ecology with what we've learned more recently about threats. And we can now start conserving these and other insects. The good news is we know how to create firefly friendly landscapes. We can start by providing an inviting habitat for both the juveniles and the adults. One way to do this is to leave leaf litter and woody debris around the edges of your yard or your property. These are places where firefly larvae can thrive. Provide moist places for the females to lay their eggs. Wetlands, pond edges, moss, any source of moisture is going to be good for female fireflies in their eggs. And if you have to have a lawn, leave your grass longer because longer grass retains more soil moisture, which is beneficial for all of the stages of fireflies. We can also reduce pesticide use. If you have a, um, if, by using organic or least toxic practices in our lawns and gardens and avoiding using broad spectrum insecticides. Also remember that fireflies need dark nights. So we can all work to reduce unnecessary outdoor lighting by using motion detectors or timers on our outdoor lights or swapping really, really bright lights for lower wattage bulbs, very simple thing to do. The basic point is to use light outdoors just when and where you need it. And for fireflies, that would be especially relevant during the firefly season. So another hopeful thing is that using our existing knowledge, we can now ask which firefly species in the US are most at risk. And we have spent the past year uh, compiling all the evidence that we have on about 140 different species of fireflies in the US data on their behavior, their habitat use, their geographic distribution, threats. And we've sorted each of these species into one of six categories um, that are used by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, ranging from um, least concern, these are things that are doing just fine, to um, various stages of threatened uh, with extinction up to the critically endangered. And we found some really good news. First, that about a third of US fireflies, including, yay, the Big Dipper firefly and the winter firefly are least concerned. They're doing just fine. Populations are stable, they're doing great. But this work also highlighted some species that we should in fact be worried about, including seven species around the US that are um, classified as vulnerable to uh, extinction, including this um, really uh, 
cute and unusual Florida scrub dark firefly that lives in a very, very dry, high uh, ridge Florida scrub habitat. 10 species that are endangered, um, including the, um, this is a Pyractamina species, the keel-necked firefly, and this Florida intertidal firefly, again, very unusual habitat specialist that lives in uh, coastal mangroves, um, which are rapidly disappearing around Florida. And then um, the most at risk of extinction um, firefly species in the US is the Bethany Beach firefly that we saw earlier in Delaware. We also discovered that we need more information on about 75 species um, and about two that are just on the border of um, close to being threatened, but they're still hanging on. Later this spring, we're going to be working with Fish and Wildlife Service and the state's Department of uh, Departments of Natural Resources to help reverse the red, to come up with plans that can safeguard uh, these threatened firefly species against extinction. Okay, so I imagine that perhaps there might be some skeptics out there asking, hold on, do we really need all these firefly species? There's so many. And after all, they're just one tiny bit of Earth's biodiversity. Yet every time a firefly species is lost, it's like extinguishing a whole room full of candles one by one. You might not notice when the first few flames flicker out, but in the end, you're left sitting in darkness. Whether we're scientists or chefs, geologists or grocery clerks, we all dream about the kind of world we want our kids to inherit, to inhabit. I, for one, hope their world includes fireflies because they offer each of us the gift of wonder. It's like an infallible recipe for falling in love again and again with nature. So I wanted to tell you about some resources if you're curious to know more. Um, one is that I wrote a book, it's called Silent Sparks. And this is really true. If you love fireflies, I wrote this book for you. It's full of stories about fireflies, firefly science, um, crazy firefly scientists, um, places around the world um, where I have traveled and seen fireflies. Really cool stuff. Um, there's also a great field guide to identifying common firefly species in the US written by Lynn Faust. I would also encourage you to check out the um, Fireflyers International Network. Uh, we have a website with lots of information. We've been collaborating with the Xerces Society and last year we published guidelines for firefly uh, conserving the jewels of the night guidelines for firefly um, conservation in the US and Canada. And we also published fact sheets in um, English and in Spanish on firefly friendly lighting practices. And these are um, free downloadable PDFs from the Xerces website. Okay, I will wrap this up by first of all, thanking all of you for coming to this talk, for your patience with the technology, for managing to um, follow the adventure from uh, Blue Button to Zoom. Really appreciate your persistence. I really wanna thank everybody at the Rochester Academy of Science for inviting me to give this spring lecture. I'm really, really grateful for this opportunity. I want to thank my um, funding sources, um, NSF and Tufts University, and my collaborators, um, the New Mexico Biopark Society and our conservation work, uh, Xerces Society, and uh, Radim Schreiber, a firefly conservationist and a photographer extraordinaire. And I will um, not play for you, but I will point out there's a great glowworm song. You can um, Google it. It's on YouTube um, by the Mills Brothers. It's a fantastic song. I highly recommend you listen to it after this talk. And with that, I would be very, very glad to take any questions that you might have.
And I will do that by, you can type your questions into the chat and I will do my best to answer them. So thank you for your attention. So um, let me start with the most recent one, which is Helen and Chris, thank you for your question. Is it always the abdomen that glows? So yes, um, for, for US fireflies, the, um, the lantern or light organ is always um, located on the abdomen of adults and also on the abdomen of, um, of larvae. Uh, you can tell in general the males from female fireflies because the lantern in male fireflies is bigger. It occupies um, two entire segments of the abdomen, whereas in females, it's usually just a tiny spot in the center of one segment. Does that help? Okay, um, let's see. Uh, Linda asks, we have been told to get rid of wet spots to keep down the mosquito population. How to promote fireflies without promoting mosquitoes? That's a really great, great question. And um, so um, it depends a, a lot of, uh, sorry to say I'm not an expert in mosquito control. But my understanding is that larvicides for mosquito, the best thing is to, yes, to get rid of um, of places where fire, where um, mosquitoes can breed so using larvicides is um, effective. Spraying for mosquitoes is usually very harmful to fireflies and other insects that might be around. So spraying for adult mosquitoes, not a good idea. Um, trying to control larval mosquito, the development of um, larvae is a better, um, a better bet. Um, in my experience, Wherever there are fireflies, there are mosquitoes. I've spent a lot of my research career um, putting up with mosquitoes in order to be able to, to work on fireflies. Um, what is, Michael asks, what is the best way to approach neighbors to change their practices? Um, I guess, you know, if you're friendly with your neighbors, you might invite them over for tea or, you know, to have a beer in your yard um, during COVID. Uh, but I think that just talking with people um, and letting them know, most cases, people just aren't aware of um, some of the advantages of, um, for example, um, native plant gardening or, uh, the practices, landscaping practices that could promote fireflies. So, you know, if you're friendly with your neighbors, I think the best thing to do is to invite them over and talk with them um, and to point them to resources where they can find out more. I really highly recommend the Xerces uh, um, firefly conservation pages. They're, they're written for pretty much anybody to understand. Um, let me see. I'm going to just scroll back here and see what we have. Abdomen, wet spots. Okay. Um, has LED lighting had adverse effects on fireflies? Yeah, this is a big one. So as many of you might recognize, if you're interested in astronomy, you already know that LED lights are extremely bright. Um, they've been installed because of their energy efficiency almost everywhere. Most cities and towns are switching over to LED street lights. Um, and a lot of them are, um, are cool white and even the warm white LEDs um, have very detrimental effects on fireflies. So I have a PhD student, her name is Avalon Owens. And um, I could show you some data, but I think I probably won't because it is getting kind of late. Um, she has a paper that just came out um, where she tested experimentally different colors of uh, monochromatic LED lights, also cool white and, um, and warm white. And all of the LED lights, um, whether they were dim or bright, 
so 10 different treat, light treatments had a, the effect of uh, diminishing the flash dialogues between male and female fireflies. In some cases, in fact, the, um, the white LEDs completely silenced the males continued flashing at a low, much lower than normal rate, but the females just completely shut up. They wouldn't respond at all. So there's a big effect of LED lights on fireflies and we know a lot about it right now. Um, okay, so let me, um, let me answer this question from David. Um, David Strong, are the glowworms I saw in a New Zealand cave part of the uh, 2200 uh, species of Lamparidae? Um, and that it was about but more than 2000 species. The glowworms in New Zealand, it's really confusing. So the common word glowworm is used to refer to a lot of different things. First, it's used to refer to glowworm fireflies as I discussed in this talk. Second, it's used to refer to the larval stage of a kind of fly in the caves in New Zealand, they are um, fungus gnats and it's the larvae that are lighting up in those caves. Those are called glowworms. So the glowworm, the cave glowworms are not fireflies. They're not counted in the 2200. And it's also used to refer to the larvae of fireflies. Um, so, uh, you know, English, it's just one of those things. Um, Ted asks, do, why do Malaysian fireflies synchronize and why do North American fireflies not synchronize? So that's a great question. Um, there are actually at least two species of North American firefly that do have a, a different kind of synchrony. So in Southeast Asia, the, fire, the teroptyx fireflies are actually, the males are stationary. So they hang out on, um, on leaves and they, they congregate in, in a particular display tree and they all flash in synchrony. So those males aren't flying around, they're sitting there. The females are flying around and they are looking to um, find a display tree, find a male and mate. In North America, the synchronous fireflies include um, the smoky synchronous firefly. Um, it's actually all through the Southern Appalachians. It's called Photinus carolinus. And, um, and another firefly that is also common in the Southern US um, called Fraturus, 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 frontalis. Uh, it's not one of the predatory fraturus, but it is, um, it's a fraturus species and they synchronize and the males fly around and synch synchronize. We call them roving synchronizers. And it's a really, really different kind of uh, selective pressure, we think that has um, caused them to synchronize. Um, so there are North American fireflies that synchronize. Also, I don't know if any of you have ever seen this, but almost any firefly species, when the males are dense enough, the population is dense enough, the males will actually synchronize their flashes. Um, not usually for like a really long time, but for a few cycles at a time, you'll see synchrony emerge and then disappear. And it seems to be associated with very high population density. Um, Is there an increase? Ah, yeah. So Liz, thank you for your question. Liz asks, is there an increase in larval success of fireflies due to the increase of the invasive jumping worms? Do the native firefly species feed off the invasive worms? It's a great question. And I wish I knew the answer to that. We, um, yeah, I just don't know. It would be a great student project, but um, I haven't gotten, gotten into that yet. Great question. Something has to eat those jumping worms. Um, okay, is the eavesdropping predator able to mimic any firefly flash signal or the species specific? Yeah, so um, the work that's been done on the uh, femme fatale indicates that the an individual female can actually by trial and error, they're, they're very, um, so those Futurist females can give a lot of different signals 
And um, by trial and error, they seem to be able to mimic the flash pattern that is effective for many, many different species of prey. So they're mimicking the female signal, many different species of prey. And, um, and that's just basically, uh, they, they look, they see, they find what works, they eat a male, they use the same signal again. So um, they seem to have a kind of a, a learning thing going on, um, depending on what kind of prey uh, signals that they're, um, they're seeing. It's a great question. Um, is there an optimal temperature on the most active nights? Yeah, so fireflies pretty much will, so two things about temperature. Um, one is that um, because they're cold blooded, all firefly metabolism is temperature dependent and that, that goes for their flash patterns too. So um, a firefly that is flashing at a certain rate at one temperature, if it's colder, that rate is gonna slow down. The, the duration of the signal is gonna slow down, is gonna be longer. And the um, higher temperatures, they're gonna flash more quickly for shorter periods of time. So um, it depends on the latitude, but um, around where in the in around where we are, fireflies will they won't fly. They'll flash, but not fly when the temperatures are below sixty degrees. When it's cooler than like fifty five degrees, maybe fifty two uh, Fahrenheit, they they'll just stop flashing altogether. And they'll they'll flash as soon as it gets warmer again. Um, wow. Uh, um, Michael points out, thank you, Michael. There's a hundred million year old firefly amber fossil matches about where genetics find, oh yeah. Whoa. Oh, um, Right, yes, thank you, that's cool. And Tony, uh, the predatory adult firefly story. Yeah, yeah, that it's a really great story there. If you Google Thomas Eisner, um, he has a, um, well, he wrote a book called um, For the Love of Insects, and it's a really great book um, about chemical ecology, uh, all of his chemical ecology studies. Um, he was pretty close to you guys in, at Cornell, and um, yeah, he had, uh, he, he did a lot of work on fireflies. Um, and yeah, so the way he found that out, actually, it's a really interesting story. It's a, a bit long. I do tell the story about it in, in my book. Um, I think it's um, in chapter seven, it's called Fatal Attractions. And it's all about um, how Tom Eisner discovered that link between the uh, predation and needing to, um, to sequester those lucibufagens that they couldn't produce themselves. And there's still a lot of things that were um, still unknown, but, but Tom Eisner really, really, broke that story and it's a it's a great one so um you could get my book out of the local library uh and and read about that it's it's a very cool very cool thing that he did um what benefit is there to under so um helen and chris ask what benefit is there to underground larvae glowing yeah so there's a lot of predators that live underground so um uh, firefly larvae are mostly underground. They sometimes, in like wet conditions, might come up to the surface and forage on the surface on the, in the leaf litter. Um, in fact, you can see them now uh, in another maybe ooh, April, May. In May, you can see if you walk out at night um, in a place where fireflies have been active, you'll see larvae crawling, very, very dim lights. Make sure your eyes get dark adapted. You can see them crawling around on the surface um, at night in the spring. That's before they pupate and become adults. Um, 
So anyways, there, um, there are a lot of predators, uh, insectivores. There's mice, there's voles, there's moles. Um, there are birds that forage in the leaf litter um, uh, in, at, at dawn and at dusk when fireflies might be act, firefly larvae might still be active. So there's um, the advantage is that um, it's a really recognizable signal. It doesn't really help to have like warning coloration that would be typically used, many other animals use, like orange and black, bright colors in a dark environment are not going to be visible, reflected light. And so using um, your own light makes a very, very highly visible signal that's a warning signal um, and, it, and it works in any dark environment, including underground. And there's, there's lots of stuff that eat insects underground. Um, are there any other insects in New York, adult, larval, or egg that exhibit bioluminescence? Yeah, so there's the giant glowworm beetles that we were talking about earlier that are um, they're, uh, in the family Fangotidae. And um, those are, um, the larvae are bioluminescent, the adult females are big and bioluminescent and the males, uh, and they also give off pheromones and the males um, are, are not. Um, I think it's chapter seven of the book. Yeah, anyways, yeah. So um, other, so the fungus gnats, um, so that we have in the United States, we also have, uh, they don't live in caves, but they live in sort of cave-like environments. The, the glowworm, larvae that, um, that are in New Zealand and Australia. We have fungus gnats that are bioluminescent in North America. Um, there are click beetles that are bioluminescent. They're not in the US, but they are in, um, in the Caribbean, in Central and South America. Um, so another, another group of beetles. Do bats prey on fireflies? Okay, um, so uh, let, let's call that the last question because it's getting kind of late. And I know you guys have been so patient. Thank you so much. Um, so a number of studies have been done on bat predation on fireflies. One of them was just actually looking at the stomach contents of uh, lots of different species of bats. No fireflies were found. Another study was done on um, training bats um, to see whether they would be trainable to avoid by a, a, a light signal. And so it turned out that it was very, very easy to train bats to avoid a very, very tasty prey that, um, that was associated with a light. And by the way, also easy to train jumping spiders to do the same thing. So jumping spiders um, are eat, eat a lot of insects. And um, the light was very, very effective in um, after just a few trials for jumping spiders and for bats in um, causing aversion learning. So um, does not seem like uh, yeah, there's a more recent paper that I just don't remember the author of, but um, yeah, there doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence for bats. There's a lot of evidence that bats avoid eating fireflies. Okie dokie. So um, thank you all for being here. And thank you very much. Sarah, for being here. You are as spectacular as your fireflies. Mm, very nice. Uh, what an absolute to say that. delight for us tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for coming and um, be well, stay well. And thank you for all of your patience with the technical difficulties. I'm so okay. sorry about that. And if you folks would like to unmute, you're welcome to uh, give a round of applause. And then I'll call on uh, Tony to see if he's got results for us. Yeah, it was worth the wait. Thank you so much. We lost a few people along the way, and I'm going to see if I can uh, uh, track them down. Uh, I was very, very sorry about that. Uh, Tony, are you with us? I am. And uh, what do we know? 
I have confirmed that our slate of candidates has received the plurality of votes cast necessary to elect for our bylaws. And so congratulations and thank you are in order to all of our officers. Okay, well, the rest of us came in on Dan's coattails. He got all the votes because he brought Sarah to us tonight. So thank you very much, Dan. <laughs> uh, thanks to Sarah, excellent talk. Okay, well, I think thank that's everything so that we have. <laughs> That's everything we have for this evening. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, if uh, I think it was Greg Kaplan fired this up for us. If he can uh, keep us live for a few minutes, people might want to uh, uh, a chat with each other. But uh, with that, I'm going to bang my really an empty coffee cup and uh, close the meeting. Thank you all very much. Uh, we'll see you for our fall lecture, the Larry King Annual Memorial Lecture. And then uh, again, a year from now, uh, for Academy-wide speakers. Uh, but of course, every month, each of our sections is offering exciting programs. So look at the bulletin. You are welcome, in most cases, to attend uh, other sections, uh, uh, talks, even if you don't belong to them, they'd be happy to have you as a guest. Anything else, Dan? Oh, nothing, I think that, uh, you know, an excellent meeting, an excellent talk. Uh, on behalf of uh, you know, you know the academy and stuff, I want to thank our you know, speaker very much. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all, and good night. Thank you. <laughs> all these people are here. Maybe we got a few people that kind of uh, <laughs> have stepped away. That's okay. we've, st we've still got Craig here, so I'm going to thank him personally uh, for throwing the lifeline. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Thank that you. was a great save. <laughs> yeah. I'm not quite sure how you pulled it off. <laughs> um, no problem. We had, we had a similar problem for Azraz the other day. So once I see it developing, I just start another meeting. And <laughs> sometimes I don't need to use it, but if it's going, then it makes it easy to work. Well, it's nice you have a fail safe just in case. Yes, yes, absolutely. It was, was a great a talk, little, so I was glad to be part of it. I was getting a little worried there that we were bombing out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Tony reminded me about two minutes into the talk that we should be recording it. So I got, I missed her introduction, but I got most of it on a recording. So. I, I don't oh, know whether yeah. you publish okay, those later yeah. and stuff. I was paying attention to make sure that it was recording when we were on the big blue button site, but then I wasn't paying attention here. So thanks for snagging that for us. Sure. Also for yeah, it's a good point. I missed that totally. I hope they weren't recording all the, the technical details. <laughs> That's on the blue button side going, what, what? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> It'll be interesting to know what happened. Yeah, I uh, must say it, it seems Zoom uh, tends to, at least my limited experience, seems to work a little smoother. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would agree. Yeah, and it might have been on Sarah's side and not necessarily uh, due to the big blue button product, un unless yeah, it's possible a, a, an incompatibility, because we did have it working very, very well by quarter after seven, and, and we yeah. had switched in and out twice. What could happen between then and 20 minutes later? Minutes later, yeah. It sounded like she lost some type of uh, you know, permission or something. It was just locking her out and wouldn't let her in. I'm kind of a you know very simple kind of guy. I like things kind of bulletproof and idiot proof because I'm dealing with myself, so I need it idiot proof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like like uh, Greg Craig hmm, Craig said. Uh, they had a problem like this with the uh, uh, one of the Ezra's meetings and had to do a quick switch over to Zoom a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I, I missed that. <laughs> I, I sometimes go to the meetings and they seem to work out, but I missed that one. <laughs> yeah, the vast majority have. Uh, we, we almost had one fail the other night because the guy did maintenance and forgot to actually turn it back on <laughs> in time for the meeting. 
Um, but he got oh. he got, Mark got to him just in time for the meeting to start, so he turned it back on. It worked fine once it uh, once it went back up. <laughs> well, okay, Michael. I think I am done. Uh, yep. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah. Okay, Craig, you are going to have to shut us off because we'll hang around forever. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Good night, all. Good day. I'm Bye -bye. leaving. <laughs> good night.